Hi, everyone. This is Stephanie Rupert. Thank you for tuning in to the Meaning of Everything podcast, where we rethink, reimagine, and gain a deeper understanding of the stuff that matters most. Today is episode number nine, and we have on Nathaniel Barrett, who is a researcher reimagining the way that we think about experience and cognitive science, and therefore creates really interesting pictures about uh, how we enjoy things and how we uh, enact our religious lives. So I'm super excited about that. I actually, so I first, okay, first and foremost, uh, throughout this episode, I live on uh, Oxford University campus. And at this time of day, unfortunately, there are often children playing uh, football, soccer in the fields uh, outside of where my recording studio is. So bear with me. I'll put myself on mute for most of um, when I'm not speaking. So uh, it doesn't bother anybody. Uh, but if you hear any whistles or kids shouting, that is why. Um, okay. That aside, I w- want to talk a little bit about Nathaniel. Uh, he prefers Nat. I want to talk about Nat Barrett. I first encountered his work when I was trying to get a grip on how and why people do what they do. And I know that that sounds super vague, uh, but I really wanted to understand how we make sense of things, how we relate to our environments. And in the cognitive science of religion today, the most dominant idea, and in popular culture too, is uh, we call it computationalism, which basically treats the brain like a computer. And in a sense, there's something that's very reductive about that. There's something uh, and also scientifically, it has it has some flaws. But also, there are things about computationalism that just don't feel great. You know, we're processing machines; we take in information, we spit out information. And again, the science um, has some flaws. And so, Nat Barrett has been part of uh, a f- small but growing number of people who are pushing back against this paradigm, looking at other ways of thinking about how the brain works, how the brain might be more networked, more in touch with our bodies, more in touch with our environments, and more interactive. You know, we design landscapes, and then the landscapes design us. And and it's sort of this co-evolving, fascinating way of constructing a human that makes us like fundamentally different in, in every different cultural context than we ever were previously which is really fascinating. And I think for me, I'll talk about this uh, in our, in the subsequent episode when, uh, when I sort of do point nine X episode nine X and talk about uh, these kinds of ideas. I want to talk about how uh, human limitations can change our ideas about who we are and what we're capable of changes when we change uh, this model, this computationalist model and it can make it more, uh, interesting for those of us who are thinking about how to be uh, better individuals and better communities. So uh, that is my perspective on what he does and why I think it's so important. I want to read a little bit about him to you so you know his background, uh, and then and then we'll get into it. Nathaniel Barrett is a research fellow and member of the Mind Brain Project at the Institute for Culture and Society, the University of Navarra in Pamplona, Spain. He completed his PhD at the Graduate Division of Religious Studies at Boston University in a program that combined philosophy of religion with philosophy and history of science, similar to what I have done, and at the same school. His dissertation used complexity science and process metaphysics to interpret the theme of spontaneity in Chinese religious thought. His research has since covered diverse topics in Chinese philosophy, environmental philosophy, and the cognitive science of religion. In recent years, his work has increasingly focused on philosophy of mind and cognitive science, especially topics related to affect, motivation, normativity, and value. He's currently working on a book about the nature and evolution of enjoyment. Uh, A few quick things are housekeeping before uh, jumping into chatting with Nap. Uh, I haven't mentioned this before explicitly, I don't think, but This podcast is on a number of different platforms. It's on as many podcast platforms as I can get it on, including Spotify. And importantly, it's also on YouTube. So if you want to look at our faces while we're talking, I'm not sure why you'd want to see this, but if if you're interested in looking at our faces while we're talking, you can catch us on YouTube. I will provide a link in the show notes. Um, And 
I will have a specific URL. You could only have a specific URL for your show on iTunes or sorry, on YouTube if you are over 30 years old and I just turned 30 so I can get a URL, but it's going to take me a hot minute. So um, that is forthcoming. The show notes uh, where I can link to these sorts of things are at stephanieruper.com and then slash the episode number. So stephanieruper.com slash nine uh, for this episode. I want to talk a little bit about the different kinds of episodes. Uh, nine is here is our interview. And then in nine X, I mentioned earlier, um, I will talk out well, we'll respond to reader questions. I might talk about something different. I might reflect specifically on um, this episode. It's basically just a space for me to interact more with the community and to share more about uh, elaborate on why these ideas are relevant, how we can relate to them, how we can make sense of them, how we can make them important for our own lives. Um, and then finally, of course, as I always mention, as a gesture of gratitude for people who are helping me uh, promote this podcast by subscribing, um, but specifically by leaving a review, I am giving away free books and I love sharing knowledge and, and my favorite books anyway, books are always flying off my shelf. So if you leave a review of this podcast on iTunes, Take a screenshot of it while you're making the review. Send the screenshot to tmoeverything at gmail.com. That stands for the meaning of everything at gmail.com. And then, uh, then you'll be entered into uh, a drawing. So I will, and then every week I will do it. I haven't yet begun uh, announcing winners because I haven't published any of these episodes yet because I'm pre-recording. And so as soon as uh, people begin uh being able to listen to the podcast and then submitting the reviews, which will be in a few episodes, then I will begin um, announcing the winners. So stay, uh, stay tuned for that. The list of books is on my website at stephanieruper.com slash book giveaway. Uh, and they're, they're lovely and fantastic. They span a wide range of topics and they're all books that I adore. So that's that. Uh, hopefully it hasn't taken too long. I've been talking quickly. I am really very excited. We get into some pretty like intellectual nitty gritty details here, uh, me and Nat, when we talk. Uh, but the themes are really accessible and it's really important um, for understanding uh, who we are and really interesting stuff about uh, how we experience things and how we can conceive of when people talk to God. So um, very cool stuff. He really excited. Here we go. And welcome, Nat. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you very much for coming. It's not often that I talk to people close to my time zone. You're in Spain, yeah? That's right. Just an hour ahead. That's, <laughs> that's very confusing. It's lunchtime right now. <laughs> yeah, it's lunchtime. Um, I usually end up doing all my, my recordings around like midnight because everybody's yeah. in California. Um, so... Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for your um, convenience. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's nice. Um, so I usually, I usually like to start these things by, you know, I, I gave a little bit of introduction both to your ideas and how I found you, uh, but I would always prefer to hear a little bit about it from uh, you personally. So uh, if you could tell me a little bit about um, what you do and also why you do it, what your hope is for your work. Like, what is it about it that is um, compelling or important? Um, I know, I know you might not, most people don't want to say my work is really important, but I think it's important. So, um, okay. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, well, I, I, first of all, I, I guess I, I should, I should say, I think of myself as a philosopher uh, and, and part of what philosophers do uh, in my view is is that we 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 critique thinking and we develop new ways of thinking um that the i guess although we don't always say so uh what one of the things we're trying to do with that is to improve thinking we want to have better ways of thinking um i should emphasize that in in my view i don't think that there's a single we should look for a single right way to think about uh, especially complex topics like religion. Uh, um, I actually think we need to cultivate a uh, nurture diverse ways of thinking um, and philosophers contribute to that by uh, criticizing existing ways, trying to make them better, but also introducing and developing new ways of thinking. I think that, that that's part of our job in the intellectual 
culture is um, to try out new ideas, um, which may not work in the long run, but uh, that's that's what we're here for, I think. Yeah, I also, as somebody who is in the world of philosophy or tangential to it, I think that that's really important. So what, like, what are the key concepts that are fascinating to you right now? Oh, right, yeah, so more specific, that was very general. Uh, so I, I would say that at the heart of pretty much everything that I've done is the what philosophers call axiology, but it's better, probably better labeled the like theory of value and what is value and when does value uh, belong to the natural world or is it uh, a projection of human consciousness? Uh, where does value come from and so forth? How do we experience it and so forth? So I, I'm, I'm sort of a, a philosopher, I would say obsessed with value and um, that makes sense. It's, I'm very much a product of my philosophical upbringing, which uh, was uh, heavily sort of steeped in um, pragmatism, especially Peirce and Dewey, and also process thought. Whitehead is a major influence. Um, and so in particular, uh, thinking about value, but not just, not just value per se, but I'm very interested in um, thinking about value as something that belongs to nature uh, in a very deep and pervasive way and is not a figment of our imagination or a projection of, the, of human consciousness, but belongs to the natural world. And that's very much a pragmatic or a process philosophy sort of orientation towards value. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm also interested in, in, in sort of bringing those kinds of arguments into conversation with co cognitive science and philosophy of science and so forth uh, to show how actually trying to naturalize value can actually help us understand the way the mind works and what experience is like and so forth. So um, I'm just not, it's not just that I'm just trying to rescue value, but I'm also thinking that by bringing value into the conversation, a lot of other problems um, maybe become uh, more tractable. Yeah, it's not something that we think about a lot in like popular discourse, right? We're not reading op-eds about the nature of value. But nope. no, not at all. But we as should, a, we should, and we should be because values, right, and and the ability to experience the world as valuable is something that hasn't, in a very understated but big way, been lost in a sense, right? We have sort of decided that things are arbitrary, right, and relative, and like you mentioned, like we we make we make them up. Uh, but there is this movement that, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of subterranean. There's not a lot of philosophers talking about it, but this is why we should be talking about it. There's this movement to sort of, you said rescue, or we could like resurrect um, value and, and argue again that it's like you're saying, right? You're saying it's a part, it's a f like the part of the fabric of the cosmos. And then we like yeah. notice it as opposed to we create it. And this, I think, is a really big like key piece of pushing back against things like nihilism yeah right yeah i would say so i mean it has that kind of deep existential significance if you want to go in that direction it definitely does I do. and, and i would i i'm there with you if you want to say it's part of the fabric of the cosmos i i agree uh but um i think we do create value but we don't it's not just created. Uh, and I think it's important to understand that we also engage value around us in the world and, and that we seek it out. We are mm. value seeking creatures, uh, but in that respect, actually we're, we're just like everything else in the world. Um, and so uh, it, it's a pretty fundamental concept, I think, or it's best treated when it's, when it's made pretty, pretty basic to our understanding of the world. I think what a lot of people try to do, and, and, and there's some very sophisticated ways of trying to do this, is they try to figure out how value enters into uh, the story, so to speak, with the emergence of life for existence, so that living things 
are valuing um, processes um, because they need to survive. And so there's a basic value built into the difference between life and death and so forth. That's a very common approach to understanding value in natural terms. And the people who think in those terms, those are the people that I sort of talk to the most um, because I'm trying to say that actually you need to, in a certain sense, go a little deeper than that. Um, but, um, but yes, it, it has those, also you mentioned value relativism. Um, that's sort of a, a, a sometimes maybe the problem of value it might be exaggerated a little bit, uh, but it's true that when we talk about value, our preferred way of understanding it is, is fairly subjective and relativist. Um, but people don't certainly don't act that way. I mean, they, 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 they argue about who's the best, you know, singer or what their favorite restaurant is. I mean, pe people's, people's way of engaging with value is, is anything but relativist, but, um, but generally our intellectual discourse about it doesn't know how to, to think of it except in those terms, I think. Hmm. Can, so is there a, like a concise way to define value? Like when, what, what are we oh. talking about here? <laughs> okay. Like, <laughs> no, yeah, no, no. In less than two question, hours, should, define yeah. value. <laughs> um, it, it's so, so I have, I have a particular theoretical take on it, but before I dive into that, or maybe in, instead of diving into that, I just want to point out that I think that the best place to start with a conversation about it is with our experience of value in the most sort of, I don't want to say rudimentary, but most like general mm -hmm. way, which is like pleasure and pain um, and any kind of enjoyment or suffering. Um, and uh, so we, we generally acknowledge that what feels good to me may not feel good to anybody else and, and what feels bad and so forth. So these experiences in terms of you know, where they come from and so forth, what circumstances and what objects we ascribe them to, they can be very different and individual. But it's, I think it's impossible for anyone to doubt that we have very powerful feelings of positive and negative value. Some, it's a, sometimes I use a more technical term, which is called like affective valence, like which is the mm -hmm. feeling of, of, of value. And I think that that is a very basic part of our experience. It's impossible to imagine life without it. Um, it's impossible also, this is very interesting, it's impossible to doubt you, you, can, you can question whether I should be feeling good about something. Say if I feel satisfied by somebody else's misfortune, mm -hmm. I can reflect on that and say, well, that's maybe not a good feeling for me to have. But I cannot doubt that something feels good or bad if it's pronounced enough in that way. There's, there's, it's sort of indubitable in that respect. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting about the experience of value, and here's where I, I think... Uh, I might surprise some people uh, who haven't uh, thought about this or looked at the literature, but it's very difficult to pinpoint what that feeling of positive or negative value is because most of the time when we like something or we don't like something, we we talk about the, the, the sort of qualities of what we like. Like if we like chocolate, we talk about how good the chocolate tastes but we don't say that there's a feeling, there's a taste of chocolate which is accompanied by a positive affect feeling. But in the science of affect and so forth, they often use that kind of language. They talk about like a, a, a gloss that is the sort of positive or negative feeling combined with a particular, particular quality and so forth. That's, that's highly problematic uh, in philosophers who've really looked closely at what positive and negative feelings are have a lot of them have concluded that there is no quality that marks something as feeling good or bad which doesn't mean that it's an illusion but it it sort of deepens the mystery uh about what is affect and so forth because it is not like 
discriminating a color or a taste or something like that. And yet, in some ways, you could say it's even more basic mm. uh, than those discriminatory capacities. So, um, it, so just that's just to give a taste, just entering into the conversation of value. I think it's you, you start with experiences that are widely shared and hard to doubt, but then you sort of go, go into them a little bit more deeply, and then it's very hard to understand them purely from a phenomenological point of view. Yeah, um, and by so, phenomenological, I, you mean like experiencing. <laughs> Sometimes I say phenomenological. I, I spent my whole life wondering what people meant when they said that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't mean the uh, like continental tradition after Husserl of phenomenology per se. Uh, they, I mean, they have discourse about ethic, but. Uh, right. Just mean, if you try to nail it down from just a purely experiential point of view, uh, mm -hmm. affect is is um, really strangely elusive. It's it's very it's because it's strangely elusive because it's something that is so intimate and commonplace. And we know if somebody asks us how are you, you can just be like, well, let me take a sec to figure out. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm feeling okay, or I'm good, or no, I'm not so good. I mean, sometimes it's a, sometimes it's not so clear how we feel about things. I, I admit that readily. It can be affect can be, can be very ambiguous or complicated or mixed or whatever. But there are so many instances in everyday life when there's no doubt. There's no about no doubt about whether we like something or we don't, or whether we feel good or bad. You, it's impossible to doubt those kinds of feelings. Um, and yet, uh, impossible to describe them as well. Mm. Yeah. So I actually I, I do I do a lot of work in affect as well and have come to understand, and this is perhaps now we can dive into, you know, um, evolution and stuff, have come to understand that affects, which is basically like our, our feeling, like our general feeling, affects are a part of our evolved animality, right? They're like a part of how humans evolved like other animals to navigate the world right to sniff out what's a better or worse option for us um and then has become deeply complexified as we developed you know in more intense uh, sophisticated perhaps cognitive apparatuses and had to then now right we have we have so many different ways of structuring our, our discussions about feelings and and what they're all like but um, ultimately, we're looking at like all things that humans are today. We're looking at a combination of our evolutionary past and the ways in which our culture has sort of like built on top of that. And our affects are just literally how we feel, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So you, um, the first paper of yours that I read was about the cognitive science of religion, um, but specifically the, the theories of cognition that lie behind it. And, and you were critiquing the thing about uh, this, the field, and, and we can maybe dive into that, but we really don't have to. Uh, but I think it's really important for us to acknowledge uh, or dig into the different, the, the new theories, the new ideas that are emerging out of the, the space of cognitive science. And it's a really big piece, I think, of how you're talking about value and how we like what we like and how we become who we become and how we uh, transcend, perhaps, you know, if, if we ever transcend anything. So um, sure. to start, can you tell us a little bit about the dominant ideas, the most popular ideas, like the computational ideas about sure. the brain and how it works. Okay, so um, I, the, the article you're referring to, I, I wrote that uh, almost almost 10 years ago, I guess mm -hmm. is when I might have started it. Um, and I've learned a lot more about uh, cognitive science since then, although my, my basic picture of it hasn't changed. Um, and uh, cognitive science 
as a field was really brought into being by the computational theory of mind. It sort of served as the linchpin of a lot of different disciplines so that they could unite and work together in theorizing about what mind is, mind as it um, uh, sort of exists in nature, but also in artificial forms like computers and so forth. Um, and so, um, I mean, more than before cognitive science, I guess before the 40s or 50s, there wasn't a field of cognitive science. There was, there, there were various disciplines that are, are of course related and continuous with it. Uh, so comp computational theory is very important. Uh, one of the things that I would say more clearly than I said then is that computational theory, it's really a paradigm. Um, it's a classic Kuhnian paradigm. And so it's not something that you refute. Um, uh, you don't sort of say computational theory can't do this. Although, I mean, sometimes I think I would try to make those arguments. Um, but in order to be an interesting and testable theory, for instance, about the human mind, for instance, it has to be specified a lot. You have to say, what is computation? It's not easy to do, uh, <laughs> to say exactly what computation is. And then you have to have a theory about how it's embodied by natural organs of cognition like the brain. There are people who do that really well. Uh, and I think actually I've read a lot more about that uh, since then. I'm somebody I really recommend is Piccinini is a philosopher who writes about what computation is and how uh, he thinks, why he thinks that the brain is a computational organ. Um, I, I, I still disagree, uh, but um, I, I want to emphasize that the computationalism is, 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 it's like a research program or a paradigm. I mean, and it's always evolving and it, and it's, it's a moving target, so to speak, for, for, for those of us who are critical. And I want to say that it, in, in, in the computational theory of mind always had competitors that in the 1980s, in the 1990s, it seems to me, although I'm not a historian, that it so dominated certain disciplines that that people really didn't think there was anything else uh out there there was and there's a phrase called the only game in town that they used to, to describe that dominates and so and that was never the case historically there were always other theoretical options that were not computational but um since the 90s they've gained ground and they've sort of come they've gained prominence so to speak and and an active theory is a prominent one um, uh, ecological psychology was always around, but I think it's gained a lot in prominence, maybe. Um, in just 10 years ago, if I talked about ecological psychology, people would say, but that's been refuted. Nobody, that's just like, that's like a museum piece. I don't think you can say that now. I think it's, it's come back uh, um, into the, maybe not the mainstream, but it's making its presence felt. Um, and there's also been a lot of work on, uh, and this is this overlaps with ecological psychology and active theory, but also dynamical systems-based approaches to cognition, thinking of the work of Kelso uh, and others. And um, so there's a lot of legitimate scientific work that is not based on the computational theory of mind, although computationists will often dispute that 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 it's just a different description of the same kind of phenomenon. Um, and so getting, getting to cognitive science of religion, it's very, I think historically, it's important to understand that that field emerged during the heyday of a particular kind of cognitive science that, that is sort of the computational adaptationist version of evolutionary psychology. And so it's sort of, established itself as a field in that theoretical context and now it's changing and one of the things that I've advocated for in that article and some other articles is that as the landscape of cognitive theory changes there's no reason why cognitive science of religion shouldn't change as well to adopt other kinds of theoretical perspectives and other strategies for studying religion that that might be uh, equally scientifically valid 
Um, and I think that that's, that continues to be the, the, the part of that article that I would, I would sort of emphasize is, is that um, there's no reason to hold to a computational platform as if it were uh, dogma. Yeah, okay, so then I agree with you, absolutely. Great. Um, <laughs> uh, and basically, I, I recently, I wrote a paper that basically was rewriting your paper. I mean, it wasn't, but you know what, sometimes you write a paper and you're like, wow, I'm basically rephrasing something that somebody else said. Uh, I do it all the time. I think it's, it's, it's <laughs> unavoidable in our field. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yes, I agree with you on that score. What is it about the idea of the brain as a computer that's problematic? And um, I mean, perhaps philosophically, but also like culturally, like we see this, right? This, this computational idea is, is everywhere, right? And it's in all the language we use. We talk about ourselves being wired for X or, you know, the brain is having hardware or software. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's everywhere. And so um, what, what's, what is wrong about it? And does that have like cultural implications? I know that's a big question, but. No, I, I, that's a good question. Okay, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. I, I would say a couple of things. Uh, one is a very big general sort of swipe at computational theory, but it has more cultural impact. Uh, and then the second one is, is, is more specifically about the way it organizes research into religion. So the first one has just to do with uh, experience. I, I mean, I, I would say that if you look at any definition of what computation is, if you look at Piccinini's definition um, or anybody else's, and you can see that in principle, there is no reason why those kinds of operations should be, uh, should have phenomenal properties or whatever you want to call them. There's, there's, there's no, in principle, there's no way to accommodate experience on the computational view. Uh, the computationalists can probably say, well, you too, because, because nobody can accommodate experience from a scientific point of view. I'm not sure that that's really fair, though, because there are a lot of different theories about the way the brain books and brain works, and some of them really resonate in powerful ways with how consciousness feels. I'm thinking of, for instance, Gerald Edelman's and Tononi's work on the dynamic core hypothesis. Um, that was a that was a theory developed in conversation with William James's stream of consciousness essay and designed to sort of register a lot of those phenomenal properties of of, being, of, of, of our experience. So I, I don't think you can just say, well, everybody's in the same boat. Nobody has a way to connect science with with experience. Um, and I think that the cultural impact of that is that we are encouraged by computational sort of frameworks to discount our experience. That's not really what's going on in our, in our minds. That the real stuff is below the surface. Uh, it's, it's unconscious inferential mechanisms and information processing. And our experience of the world is a sort of like, uh, at best, it's a sort of like a show put on uh, uh, for what purpose it's not clear. Um, but it's, it's not uh, the meat and potatoes of, of cognition. And, and I think that that, um, well, some people get upset about uh, issues of free will and so forth. Um, I, I don't particularly take up that fight myself, but, but uh, definitely there is a kind of, there's something alienating uh, because of the way experience cannot be treated. As, as cognitively important by computational theories. At least that's, that's my view of them. Now the more specific critique that has to do with religious studies, I think you know that really well. That has to do with the way that information has to be constrained, in my view, in order for it to plug into the computational mechanisms of the mind. So they, they, there's some way in which I think computational approaches, they really, constrain the mind world relation. They need it to be sort of uh, fixed in certain ways so that the computational 
operations can can work and be grounded uh, in the world and help us do what we need to do. They're really problem solving. Uh, computation is as are usually it's it, it it views mind as a kind of problem solving, but those problems have to be already pretty well specified, and the information we need to try to solve them needs to be pretty well specified so that we can go about that kind of computational process. And I think that the world is, is a lot um, it's a lot messier in a certain way, but in another sense, from an ecological perspective, there's actually a lot more information out there uh, for us to select from. And so, um, and selecting the information that we want to engage that interests us, uh, I, I tend to think that that's very hard to do from a computational point of view. And that constrains the way we look at religion in many ways, I think, because it, religion becomes increasingly, it's something that's happening in the head. It has to do with how we're processing data that we, that the data that we receive from the environment is the same, or I should say, no matter whether we're religious or not, right? But in the case of religious persons, uh, uh, maybe there are certain biases, inferential biases that uh, that um, I guess, but we're supposed to share those. But but the, the but the real uh, religion is a totally in the head phenomenon. Um, and uh, I think that there is a lot empirically to learn about religion from not thinking of it that way. Um, Yeah, I, um, yes, again, uh, I, I see a lot there that's really interesting. So if this is, <clears throat> if these are the flaws or the shortcomings of this particular view, then perhaps you know what my next question is, what is your proposed alternative and yeah. why is it superior? <laughs> Why is it superior? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what? Well, you know, I'm going to dodge that question a little bit because I think I think my job as a philosopher is not. I mean, I really. I mean, I'm. I'm just, with respect to to religion. Let's face it. I, I'm an armchair theorist, right? So uh, my. I mean, I have a lot of respect for people who do field work, especially ethnography. And, um, but also, I mean, in cognitive science, there's both lab work and field work. And, and, and I'm playing with ideas in the confines of, of you know, the library. And so um, what I'm trying to do is, is to point out that um, different ways of thinking about how the mind works may orient our empirical studies, including even field work differently. Uh, and I, I, I think the most that I can hope to contribute is to convince other scholars uh, to take up those different ways of thinking and, um, and, and, and turn them into a research program. I mean, also, I would just say, going back to my principle about like we need a lot of different ways of thinking about religion. I mean, in cognitive science of religion can benefit enormously from diversifying its its theoretical approaches um, and having them compete with one another and so forth. And so, in a certain sense, I'm not recommending just one alternative, but I'm just saying any alternative. Just let's have let's have something that isn't so head focused and computational in its sort of theoretical roots. Um, and then, and see how that plays out. The problem is, is that, you know, they, insofar as they really want to do uh, science and measure things, um, that's a constraint too. And sometimes my recommendations about doing things differently are oriented more towards anthropologists than towards uh, psychologists. Um, but ju just if I could give an example, since this is such an abstract conversation, um, I mean, one of the things that I've written about is the way in which environments are adapted to religious practice. And so the, the context of different religious rituals and so forth are specially adapted to the kinds of experiences that people want to have in those practices. 
Uh, if you think about experience as something that's entirely manufactured by the head rather than a product of interaction with uh, a complexly structured environment, you're not going to pay as much attention to the way in which environments are being adapted to the experience. Um, but there's a wonderful, just to give an example, which overlaps with religion, but it's really more about music. Uh, there's a wonderful TED talk by David Byrne uh, of the Talking Heads, or originally of the Talking Heads, about the way different spaces uh, fit with different kinds of music. And he goes, he sort of goes really quickly through a history of music and he shows how, you know, African drumming is perfectly adapted to the setting in which uh, it emerged in, in those cultures. Uh, uh, sort of um, the church music of medieval cathedrals is perfectly adapted to that setting. And if you take those two kinds of music and you put them in, in, in each other's settings, they don't work at all. Uh, you cannot, you, you do African drumming in a, in a Gothic cathedral and it's just a mush. Right? You can't have that kind of rhythmic intricacy uh, in that acoustic space. Um, but he goes through all these different kinds of music. He talks about his own music and how that was adapted to the sort of clubs in which he played with Talking Heads. Um, and, uh, and it makes perfect sense. And there's nothing particularly mysterious about it. Uh, but once somebody calls your attention to it, you're like, yeah, that's, that's a really important pattern of musical culture is sort of adapting musical expression and creativity to the space in which it's most likely to to uh, be performed and so forth i think religion is the same uh in many ways uh but we don't i don't think even ethnomusicologists that are interested in religious music they don't always look at the space that way maybe um, Okay, so those are great examples. And I found them, I found these kinds of ideas that you talk about uh, really fascinating because they're, they open up spaces that computationalism sort of forecloses on. That, um, and I think this is where your ideas about meaning and value sort of come into play, right? Because in these alternative conceptions that you're looking at, you there are ways to talk about human experience as uh, I don't want to say like more real than than in a computationalist sense, but um, you, as we were saying earlier, to sort of ground them. And so, how does my question is how do your ideas about value fit into this new? framework these frameworks of cognition that you're interested in and then like what is the relevance to the sort of examples that you're talking about like this idea of us being a, like naturally inherently valuing things Ooh, um so <laughs> sorry <laughs> the case of um so it my way of theorizing about value in the case of um, in the case of religion, uh, and then more generally, uh, so uh, it's, it's maybe easier just to talk about religion. One of the things that I've argued for is that um, Religious practice can be an intrinsically motivated activity, much like other activities, like music or sports or, you know, a lot of things that we do for fun. Um, and I'm not saying that it always is that way, but certainly a lot of practitioners want it to be that way. They want it to sort of come alive, <coughs> excuse me, and have a kind of uh, rich texture that, um, that sustains the practice uh, makes it intrinsically worthwhile. Um, I mean, you could say, no, 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 it's, it has an instrumental value because they're trying to get something through the religious practice, um, like, you know, appease a potentially, you know, angry and vengeful deity or something that could be, uh, but I, I think for all, the most part, 
uh, people look to religious uh, ceremony and festivities and rituals and so forth uh, for more immediately enjoyed values. Um, <clears throat> and when they don't have them, uh, they wanna adapt themselves to, to the practice or they wanna adapt the practice to them. This is sort of a two-sided affair in order to sort of tune up that, that interaction so that it's rich, richly rewarding. Um, not in the same way necessarily that uh, a musical concert is, but I think that thinking about these other ways of tuning up our enjoyment of, of events is a good place to start. Uh, and then we can think about what might be distinctive in the case of religious enjoyment. But, um, uh, so I, I mean, so just, just to begin with, I, I, I urge that we, we look at, you know, religion as uh, intrinsically uh, motivated. And then what goes along with that is that uh, there are certain, of course, um, meanings uh, or uh, uh, ways of understanding life or our relationship uh, with God or with, um, or of some ultimate reality, which we want to, um, I think religious people want to perceptualize them. This is a word that I'm using in a specific way, which is that they don't just want to think about it, but they want uh, to make it sort of experiential for them. Uh, and I really, I think a wonderful book to read about this is Tanya Lerman's When God Talks Back, which is about how a kind of evangelical charismatic practice um, uh, uh, involves a process of learning by which people come to be able to discern God's voice in their own thoughts. And uh, that is, she says something uh, in a talk of hers about how that's how they use their imagination to develop a, a sort of way of experiencing and interacting with something that they do not think is imagined. And I think that that's something that uh, a lot of religious pra practices share. In this case, she's pointing to a practice which is largely directed towards the inner life, you could say. You know, it's continuous with Ignatian spirituality and those kinds of techniques. And a lot of religious traditions develop those sort of inner mechanisms for sort of visualizing in meditation and so forth. But I would say the great majority of religious practice makes use of materials in the environment to perceptualize religious meanings uh, in lots of different ways. And so, I mean, everything from sort of the, the simplicity of a Quaker meeting house is, is intentionally designed in su such a way uh, to uh, facilitate the kinds of experiences of God that Quakers are seeking. Uh, but in very different cultures, uh, you have a very different environment um, that's tailored to a different experience. But in all cases, uh, it's the experience that is being taken care of. And uh, you know, they have different ways of thinking, but they want to put that, those thoughts into their perceptual experience somehow. And so how, how is that possible, like to manifest? You're saying that there's like a desire that, is there a desire that motivates this imaginings? Like what, what makes it happen? Or is it because it's in our environment and as, as we're growing up or something, right? Like how, how does this um, voice get created or become real? Oh, uh, you mean in the case of religious practice? Sure. It, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I think for most of human history, it's something that that people grow up with uh, in their in their cultural environment, and it's just something they pick up. Right. Uh, but so, like, how are they? How is this different? Is this any different? Say, when you hear God talking to you, um, is this in any way different from when you hear? How is it different from when you hear another? person who's in the room with you talking to you, right? Oh, um, well, Lerman's book has a lot of detail about that. Um, and they don't mistake God's voice for somebody behind them. You know, right. it's, not, it's not the same thing. Uh, and it's a, and it's a, it's a lengthy process of 
discernment <coughs> and um, they have language for talking about how they sort of tune in uh, and it's um, uh, so th there is a sense in which it's distinctive um, and it's not to be confused with everyday conversations. But nevertheless, um, it is supposed to approximate a certain features of our experience of a normal conversation. So it shares something uh, perceptual, uh, mm -hmm. in, in, of, of a perceptual nature, I should say, with everyday conversation. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I've also I've thought a lot about how music is used in ritual to simulate the presence of maybe spiritual beings, or to simulate or to to to, to affect a feeling of unity of like uh, shared consciousness and there's a lot of work that's done on that um, and um, these two are I think they're perceptual experiences but I don't think it's necessary to insist that the subjects mistake them for uh, other kinds of uh, perceptual experiences like perceiving agency in music is a kind of perceptual experience, I think, but that doesn't mean that we mistake the agency in a piece of music for, you know, a, a real object that's coming towards us or something like that. Right. And okay, so are you, does this rule out or are you careful in your work to say this does not rule out uh, the possibility that these phenomena people experience are actually in some sense, like metaphysically true, right? Like, is God actually talking to them? Is, yeah, I, this, is this too I sensitive a question? Generally try not to, <gasps> to, 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 to take a position on that. Um, That's great. It's uh, intellectually but, responsible, I think. Uh, but, I, let, let, well, let me just, uh, let me back up. My, my, my work on religion is naturalistic. And one of the things that I'm trying to do is show that within the limits of what can be said about religion naturalistic, there is a lot to explore. And that depends on our theoretical framework, but also, and also the, you know, which also interacts with the kinds of uh, data or whatever that we, we look for. Um, and so, um, you know, I, just to take Tanya Lerman's work as an, an example again, I mean, she was, she was very interested in how these people learned to experience the voice of God. Uh, and she approached it as a process of learning, which some people might think is incompatible with their understanding of that as a gift of grace. But I don't think that her subjects thought of it that way. Um, uh, so she, she was able to, to leave that open. Um, and I, th I think that that kind of work is enormously important for understanding religious cultures from the outside uh, and for respecting them without necessarily accepting their, what you call metaphysical claims or theological claims. Um, uh, so that's. that's yeah. That's yeah, no, sorry. I, you know, I didn't express my motivations in asking that question, but, you know, I think in our common dialogue, you know, about religion and, and religious beliefs, uh, you are either studying it and, sort of hold it at a distance and it's like alien or stupid, right? Like literally in our culture, um, or you love it. And there's not a lot of space being held for in between. And I just, I want to demonstrate to people that there is actual, like that space actually exists. 
um, where you can be like respectful and thoughtful about people's experiences and what might be very valuable or true about them and still study them and want to understand them even in, you know, in a, in a scientific way. Um, and so I, yeah, I really appreciate that. I agree that, that no, I, I agree. And I think that that space is actually, it's shrinking, which is very, I think it's important for uh, people to, to try to enlarge it uh, because uh, it's very important. I mean, a lot of religious dis discourse about religion is too fixated on the question of its truth. Uh, not that that's not important, but what happens, and this is related to you know the questions that really matter to religious practitioners, is that you get you get to a point where there's such a cultural divide. It's not so much that people are really interested in arguing about whether a certain theological claim is true or not, but they just have this attitude that, but like, why would you even want to believe that? It's so silly. It just doesn't. It just. It's meaningless. It's meaningless for outsiders. So it has no meaning or value to them, uh, a lot of theology, and they just think it's childish. Um, that's, that's not so much the same as saying it's true or false. It's just like, it's, it's too silly even to care. You know, um, that's, a, that's a major, cultural divide when you, I mean, and that's different, I think, from discussions about belief and unbelief that maybe happened in centuries past, where there was oftentimes from more sensitive uh, atheists, a sort of nostalgia and a kind of, well, I wish I could believe that that were true, uh, but I just can't because the facts have moved me, uh, you know, to another position. But now it's just kind of, it's, it's not even like, I wish I could, I could share this belief. It's kind of like, well, that's, you know. Yeah, it's, it's dismissive as opposed to um, empathetic or considering, you know, and I mean empathetic in the sense of wanting to understand Absolutely. how and why that's valuable. Um, I, you know, not, not to keep returning to her, but she has been, she's a good example. Lur, Tanya Lerman got a lot of criticism from people who felt that she wasn't critical enough of the charismatic evangelical sort of tradition that she was trying to understand. Um, but I, I, I really think that empathy is, is very important. And in the case of religion, it means trying to understand what is really meaningful and valuable uh, for, uh, for practitioners and, and how that happens. And you can, you can go quite deeply into that and still um, not, not even be agnostic. You can still say, but yeah, but I don't, I don't actually think that the literal theological claims are, are convincing, but I can see how embedded in this how they are embedded in this practice which gives people an enormous amount of meaning uh and and that's i think that's very important and hard to do it's very yes. hard to do that. and 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 to understand why they would be compelling to you if you had been you know raised in that context right yeah. um yeah that's very important um so i realized that we have actually been talking for a uh, longer time than i said i was i was telling that earlier i always try to limit these to 47 minutes and i never make it ever but i take i take some of the blame for that too right well this this is a partnership you know <laughs> this is a co-creative moment um as whitehead might say so uh, that's right yeah so uh, we we hold dual for that and there are so many um so many fascinating things uh, here that we talked about that didn't we didn't get into but in the future all of these things we um, we will be discussing. So do you have um, maybe like your academia.edu site, do you have somewhere where people can engage your work if you want, if they want? Yeah, I, I'm on ResearchGate and Academia. Um, I think those are the best places to find stuff. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, um, I mean, usually, so I have another 
um, I have a podcast in, um, in women's about women's health and women's issues. And everybody always has like a long list of social media profiles that they want to be followed and videos yeah. that they want to be liked. And now I talk to academics a lot and I'm like, well, you have like papers, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah. And, and they're, they're technical, but, but really, um, really interesting reads if you're into this sort of stuff. So I will, I will link to that in the show notes. Of course, you can uh, find me at Stephanie Ruber, uh, dot com and on the social media profiles. Um, and you can be watching these on YouTube or listening on any of the platforms. I will also, again, link to those in the show notes, will, which will be at stephanieruper.com slash um, nine. I think I said this was episode nine. Um, so again, uh, thank you a lot, Nat. This has been uh, wonderful uh, for me. And thank you to everybody uh, for tuning in. I will talk to you next time. Take care. Thank you. 